Okay. Um, also, before we get started, that just brought up a good point. Let me also say, since we are using Zoom, uh, this is not a secure network, so therefore we will not discuss classified information. This is only this is solely used for training purposes. Again, we will not be discussing classified information. All right, let's move forward. Let me get you guys' videos out of my screen. Okay, so today we will be discussing enlisted evaluations. Hopefully all of you can see the PowerPoint that is on the screen. All right, so first and foremost, before you even get involved in evaluations, all of you at the first class fit level should know this, but if not, that is okay, you're gonna learn today. It is Buper's instruction, 1610.10 Delta. All right, it is a very large instruction. However, I highly recommend that on your downtime, when you have time, take a look through it and read through it. Read through the different sections in the evaluation instruction because there's something in there for almost everything that you have to deal with in the Navy. Everything. It is a very large instruction. Take a look through it. Another resource that we are using is the selection board convening order. For those of you that are up for chief, as we had training with your packages, this is very important to you. This tells the master chiefs what to look for when they sit down at that board and go through all of your evaluations, this tells you what they're looking for. This is your bread and butter. So if you have not, as a first class petty officer, if you have not seen a convening order, I challenge you, go to the Navy NPC website, go under enlisted boards, and you can click on CPO, SCPO, or MCPO. But either way, the convening order is there. Click on the convening order, review it, read through it, get familiar with it. That is your go by. And then last but not least, resources here will be the CPO evaluation. But uh, the information we're gonna talk about can be utilized on your E1 through E6 evaluations as well. Okay, so we're gonna discuss some basics. I'm gonna go over some basics within this PowerPoint. If at any given time, any of my brothers and sisters wanna step in, please do. Uh, first classes, if you all have any questions, uh, please ask. I do not mind answering, and I did not mean to do that. I need to go back. Hold on, let me. Uh oh. Technical difficulties. Let me go back. Accidentally hit the button. Uh, there we go. All right. So, starting off, know your audience, know who you're dealing with, know who you're talking about. What does that mean? Any first class, chime in and tell me what do you think that means? Know your audience. Just tell me your thoughts. Any first class, tell me your thoughts. What does it mean by know your audience when you're writing evaluations? I would say think about the people that's going to be reviewing your evals and your packages when you're up for uh, the bulwarks. Okay, awesome. I can't see who spoke. The screen, my screen doesn't show, so whoever it was, thank you. But awesome. Anybody else? Is it no so more like knowing what their strong suits are and their weak suits so you can um, write their evals to perfection? Okay. All right. Okay, so both of you guys gave gave great answers. Um, I want to I want to specifically go back to that first one. So when you're writing these evaluations, are you writing the evaluation to the member, or are you writing it to someone else? To someone else. Okay. And so for let's say for example, first classes that are going up for a cheese board, you're writing those evaluations to those board members and it's coming on behalf of your CO. So when it says know your audience, do you think it's wise to use, uh, you know, flashy and big words when you're writing these evaluations? Negative. Okay. So I say that because it goes right into my next bullet of it's not official Navy correspondence. You can use the at symbol, you can use the and symbol percentages, you can use common acronyms, but common acronyms is what would be common to any rate. 
Because you got to understand when these master chiefs are sitting on your board, you might not have an NC that's on your panel. You might not have a PS that's on your panel. You might not have a QM that's on your panel. I'm an HM. I might have a uh, OS on my panel. So therefore, if I'm writing an eval, and if I use a term that only Corman know, then when that eval goes to that board, now that OSCM has to sit there and think about, well, what does this mean? So common acronyms would be, as you see, CMD, right? Command, SIMEO, DAPA, UPC, something that is not rate specific. We all can apply for those type of jobs. We all can do those jobs. But non-common acronyms, for example, all those you see right there are like Corman acronyms. Some of you guys probably don't even know what MERS is. I know exactly what that is. But, but if I'm going to put that in the evaluation, I'm going to spell that word out. So therefore, the person that's sitting at board can say, okay, I can, I can tell this is a medical term. Let me ask maybe an HMCM that's sitting at this board about that. But you have, to, you have to know your audience in the sense of you cannot use specific acronyms that are specific to your rate. Only common acronyms. Everything else needs to be spelled out. Does that make sense? That I see sense. Wilcox looking his head. Okay. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Be clear and concise in your writing. And, and, and we're going to get to that. As we go through this PowerPoint, we're going to go through some examples. But be clear and concise in your writing. Don't use run-on sentences. Be clear and concise. Make it, make it easy to understand. Eliminate the fluff in uncommon words. And this goes back to knowing your audience. Dexterous, acumen. Though those are very nice big words to use, what if I'm sitting at board and I don't even know what that word means? Why are you making me have to go pull out Webster's Dictionary to understand a word that you use in evaluation? All we want to know is what did, what did your sailor do? Why is your sailor so great? Because you're, you're making the sailor sound great. Why are they so great? Eliminate adverbs. And I know you all have seen this. Skillfully, successfully, meticulously. All right, if you can, by all means, if you can eliminate those, do so. And once again, I'm gonna show you some examples where we'll see some thick paragraphs, but yet we can downsize those paragraphs. Call out and breakout statements are a must. All right, so let's stop there. Call out and breakout statements are a must. As a first class, you need to understand this because you're gonna be writing your evals on your second class. And believe it or not, starting at the second class level, some, a lot of those evals can be looked at for chief, especially if you had a hot runner. If somebody made third class, second class, and first class quickly, those second class evals are gonna be reviewed for chief. So call out and breakout statements are, a, especially if you are saying that they are your hot runner. So, how many, how many of you have heard the saying, playing in traffic? I have. Okay. Playing in traffic, right? So how well do you play in a large summary group? That's what the board wants to see. If you're a one-on-one, -on -one, you're a one-on-one. -on -one. We'll talk about that later. But if you are ranked against 30, 40 other first classes, how well did you do? against those 30, 40 other first classes. Where do you rank out at? So it's kind of like, I like, to th I like to think of it as reading a book, right? I'll be honest with you guys. I don't like reading books too often, unless it's leadership books. But if I'm reading a book, it has to be something about that book that catches my eye. It has to be a, a statement or, or something in the title or something on the introduction that makes me want to continue reading that book. If that book looks plain, Jane, and simple to me, I don't want to read that book. So you have to think about your write-up as you writing a book on someone. That first statement is what's going to catch the eye. All right? If you don't give me a reason to want to keep reading what's in that statement, then you're already going to lose me. If you sit there and you tell me a sailor, oh, the, you know, uh, perform job well, uh, it's excellent, and it's ready for the next pay grade. Okay. Cool. But if you tell me rank number two of 28 fiercely competitive first classes, so forth and so on, now I'm like, okay, so it's rank number two. So what did this sailor do? What did he or she do that makes them rank number two? Let me continue reading. And then that same concept goes for the closeout. Strong closeout statement with promotion recommendation. 
If you're going to open that sailor up strong or we're going to open yourself up strong, you better close strong. There's no point in me reading this book just to get to the end. Matter of fact, how many of y'all have watched the movie and you got to the end and the movie just ended and you're like, what the hell? And you were probably like, how are you just going to end the movie like that? Same concept with your eval. Same concept. If you're going to open that sailor up, being basically saying they walked on water, then you better close that sailor out saying that they parted that Red Sea. Does everybody understand that so far? Got it, Chief. All right. Easy day. That's what I want. I want feedback and questions. All right. Also, you must have quantifiable data. So do understand that when you are writing these eval blocks, you're not writing an essay. This is not a thesis. This is not a capstone project for your degrees. You need to have quantifiable data of what your sailor is doing. Now, one thing I can say about NCs and, and uh, CP3, Chief Attilo can, can vouch for this, is you guys have a lot of quantifiable data, a lot. I mean, you, re recruiters, you guys are built around, it's, it's like you're built around numbers, it's there. It should not be that difficult for you to say how many, how many uh, applicants a sailor has put in, uh, how many reefs have they obtained. Uh, when you talk about you met goal, well, what does that mean? And, 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 and I speak on that because when I first got here, when I first got here, I read a package about a sailor that made goal. I'm an HM, I'm not a CRF. So when you write down that they made goal, what does that mean? What was entailed in that goal? Because you guys get goaling letters, right? You get production guidance. So what is entailed in you or your station making go or your division or whatever? What is entailed in that? Break that down. Put those numbers in there and then talk about what it resulted in. Did you get large station of the year? Did you get LPO of the year? Did uh, I know last year, uh, office, officer recruiting here at NRD Atlanta got number one OPO in the nation. So if that's the case, what did we do individually as officer recruiters to impact us making number one OPO in the nation? Does that make sense so far? Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. And then last but not least, I know Chief Evans and any, any other PSOYN would love this part is format, format, format. Format, format, format. Let me tell you guys something. If you do not format your evals, and I'm going to pull up a template that you can use. If you don't format it correctly, there's no point in even sending that eval in. It's just going to be invalidated. All right. If the social is not right, if the administrative portion is not right, if there's a gap eval, those are the little things you have to pay attention to before you even get to the eval writing. You need to make sure that your eval is formatted correctly. All right. Some, some of you guys have evals in your records right now that have a gap, have a gap date. And that's the reason why going up for chief is your responsibility to make sure that that eval gets corrected or that you send it in with your package. Because how can we expect you to take care of your sailors when you don't take care of yourself? Think about that for a second. How can we expect you to take care of your sailors and make sure that their evals are good when you can't even look at your eval and make sure that it's good? When, you, when, when your chief hands you your eval, some of y'all, the first thing you do is look at that block 43 or look at that promotion recommendation. And honestly, the first thing you need to be doing is verifying your administrative data at the top. You need to be making sure your social is good and that your from and to dates are correct and that your report date is correct. Your designator, your name, all that good jazz. That's what you need to be looking at first. You're no longer that E3 or E4 now. You're that, you're that leader. All right. I think I've hit that part enough. So this PowerPoint comes from one of my brothers over at, at the Marine unit. So every, and I'm starting off with that because every command has their own template of how they want the opening and closing to look. Every command has an eval uh, command instruction. NRD Atlanta has one. And last, I remember last cycle, I want to say Mr. Simpson sent that out. I could be, I could be wrong. But every command has an eval instruction. So review the command eval instruction and make sure that it fits the format for that command. That's what your job is as a leader. Here, here is what they use. And it's not a bad go by. A lot, a lot of, a lot of the, the commands are kind of along the same lines. The first block, 
all caps, strong opening with the promotion recommendation. And you got your asterisks. Some commands allow two or three asterisks, some commands only allow one. All right, but the key point there is the strong opening with the promotion recommendation. Once again, my number, my number blank of blank of fiercely competitive first classes, uh, EP or whatever the case might be. Or you can save the promotion recommendation for the end. And then it goes into the actual sections, leadership. So let me tell you guys something, as first classes, as first class is going for chief, my take is your eval needs to start with leadership. It needs to start with leadership. It doesn't matter if you're an NC1, QM1, HM1, EM1, you're a leader. And even, even here at a special duty command where you are recruiting, you're still leading, right? Because you have debt management. You're still leading those future applicants. As a DLPO, you're leading your, your uh, fleet sailors. As a fleet sailor, you can still do leadership out within the FCPOA. You are still leading. So find your niche, find your way to make sure that your leadership block has information in it. If you're not leading, then how are you expecting to move to the next level? Now, I'm talking to first classes right now, so it's easy to say leadership. Let's talk about your E5s or E4s, right? Because I'm expecting you guys to, to write evals. Your E5s and E4s, if they don't have leadership right there, that's fine. You could talk about their technical proficiency, their technicalities, especially at the E4, E5 level. I can tell you right now that on a ship, if you come into medical, as a chief, you won't see me first. I can tell you that. But you will see my HM2, or you will see my HM3. So they're the ones that are performing the duties. So technicality is huge for them. Now, at the, at the E5 level, at that HM2 level, uh, I would still recommend that they get leadership. And if they have it, then put that in there. Because once again, that eval is going to be looked at for chief. If you are starting at the E5 level of leading, you're on the right path. But that's when it goes back to knowing your audience, like we talked about before. Depends on what eval. You're writing E4 eval, E5, or E6 eval. All right. Next bullet they got is, is uh, management or command. So for my second bullet, I usually love putting command impact there. We know that you're leading. We know that you're leading sailors. We know that you're impacting sailors. That's what we want from you. But now, what are you doing for the command? So here's where I pause and I ask, I ask first classes, under command, what are, what, are some, uh, what are some information you can put there under command? Uh, MWR. MWR, okay. What else? Uh, if you was an ACFL, you could put how many people in your division passed uh, the PRT, if you had 100% pass or whatever. Okay, good job, Will Cox. I don't want to hear from you. Next, somebody else. Command training team, how many trainers you gave out to the command and how effective it was? Awesome. There you go. So with, with what you guys just said, I heard CFL, I heard MWR, I heard command training team. What do those sound like to you? What are those called? Collateral duties. Bam. There we go. It ain't rocket science. It ain't rocket science. And Chief Evans typed in, you lead people and you manage things. I love it. I absolutely love it. You lead people and you manage things, or you could say you manage processes, but you lead people. So that's why leadership is first. You're leading sailors. But then in the second bullet, when we talk about command, now you're managing processes or collateral duties. So what are you doing? So here's where on the front of your eval, I want to say it's block 29. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chiefs. I want to say it's block 29 is where, we, uh, where you put your collateral duties. And in that block, you're going to put whatever you hold, whether it's uh, ACFL, whether it's uh, command financial specialist, or uh, um, what is it, Navy, Navy Marine Corps Leaf Society, that's where you put what you did for collateral duties. Well, guess what? If you're going to put that collateral duty on the front of your eval, you better put something on the back in this block right here about what you did with that collateral duty. Because if you don't, if I'm looking at your eval and I see, the, I see the front and I see that you hold that collateral duty, but I look at the back and I don't see anything about it, then what did you do? 
Did you just go get a title? Were you just trying to have a collateral duty just so you can say, I have a collateral duty and try to get points for it? Negative. If you're going to do a collateral duty, you need to actually perform doing that collateral duty. And the old saying goes is get you maybe one or two collateral duties that you can be strong at and run them. Don't go out there and try to get four or five, six collateral duties. Go get you one or two and be strong in those collateral duties. And after you've done them for a year, hand that collateral duty over to somebody else because now you have perfected it. If you've done career development team at your last command and you, you check on board here and you hop back on career development team, where did you grow? Where was there room for growth? We, we get it. You're good at career development. You love it. But you know what you can do? Here's what you can do. If you have done something and you're great at it, lead somebody else. Find somebody else in your division and say, hey, uh, QM2 or NC2, I'm good at career development. I've done it. I love it. I think you'll be great at it. How about you put in for that collateral duty and I'll mentor you on how to run it. Now you got leadership. Now your sailor has got a good eval bullet for them and you might help that sailor get advanced. That's how this, 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 this terminology called iron sharp and iron works. All right. It also shows a skill diversification. So <laughs> the, um, taking on a collateral duty that's kind of opposite the comfort level of your own job mm -hmm. or position demonstrates to the board your adaptability. So there's leadership at all levels. Chief okay. McCauley will tell you that, you know, you know I, I got to lead a division in a hospital corpsman thing. Now that's a primary job, but that was outside of my comfort zone for what my employment is. So taking on a collateral duty, such as like a DAPA or current management type person, when you're like say an engineer type rate, that, that really just demonstrates to the board a certain level of adaptability. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm glad you touched on that, um, bro, because how often do you see um, first classes or just petty officers stick with one collateral for the duration of their time at a command. Like you have to show that diversity. You can't be on the CRT team, you know, for two years, three years. You could just sit on that team, but it doesn't look good on your eval if you're just doing that one thing. Pass it on, pass it to someone. Um, you may have someone in your station that you want to recommend it to or something, you know, iron sharpens iron. You definitely want to have that diversity. UPC, you know, MWR, uh, it, the CFL, ACFL, you, you want to change it up. It's good for you and it's also good for your record. Definitely. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Great, great sound advice. And, uh, and once again, if you are looking for collateral duties that are beneficial, you can go to the convening order, see what they're looking at. It's right in there. I can tell you right now, mentorship is huge. Mentorship is huge. All right, and then the last bullet, FCPO mess, Sailor 360, uh, or community involvement, okay? Um, I can tell you right now, and CMC has said it here himself, if you are not involved in the FCPOA, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can you expect for us to bring you into our mess and you don't even play along with your own mess? If you don't play well with your brother and sisters at your pay grade right now, how can you expect to come in and play with us? You think it's just gonna happen overnight? You think you're just gonna get selected and you're just gonna come in and we're gonna be, hey, hey what's going on, bro? Negative. That's not how that works. That is not how that works. So I learned that at an E5 level. I was told by a chief at an E5 level, you need to be involved with your SCPOA and your FCPOA before you get here. Because if you're not doing that at that level, how can we expect you to just change? It doesn't happen. You're gonna continue to do the same thing that you have done to get there which means you're gonna be by yourself. And in the chief's mess, we don't, we don't function like that. Not one chief can do this by themselves. We are only as strong as our weakest link. And we are only a chain when we stay together and don't break the links. Y'all have to have that same mindset as the FCPOA. All right, so if you're not involved in the FCPOA, you need to get involved. And I have told y'all numerous times, you don't have to be an officer. You do not have to be an officer to be involved in the FCPOA. I get it, we, we, none of us chiefs were born yesterday, okay? We know how voting goes. Sometimes it's who people like, whatever the case might be, whatever you wanna call it. But that does not matter. If you do not hold an officer position, get out there and lead within your association. Put together a fundraiser, put together a volunteering event. 
if you go to church, put together an, a, 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 an event at your church and invite some of the first classes there if they want to come. But you find a way. It's a whole buffet. And whenever you go to a buffet, there's a lot of food at that buffet. If everybody eats the same thing, what's the point of the buffet? And, you know, uh, during my mentoring, you know, with, with my first classes and just with any first class in the command, I'll ask that question. Like, are you involved with your mess? And one of the, the most, <laughs> like, frequent answers that you get is that we don't do nothing, Chief. We, you know, everybody's so spread out. You know, we, we don't never do nothing. I can't, you know, reach out. You usually only get the cabinet members are, are the ones that, that show up because that's the, like, we were first classes at some point. So I get it. I get it. It's almost like, uh, unfortunately, like a crabs in a bucket type thing, you know, when it comes to first classes, because everybody's trying to make cheap for the most part. So if you are active in, in the, the first class mess, it's probably because you're trying to, you're trying to get that, that billing on your eval, you know, you, you, you shit hot, excuse my French, and you just want to be active in the mess where you have everyone else that doesn't really do anything. But it doesn't have to be that way. Like Chief said, you don't have to have a position to be active in the mess. You know, you may have a cabinet member that ain't doing nothing. Work them out of their job. <laughs> you know, you can still be active. So, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when it comes to being active in your mess. You know, CB3, you brought up, you brought up a great point. Um, as I sit here and, and for all you first classes that are paying attention right now, if you look at this section, the leadership section, right? It talks about you leading sailors. For the most part, it's probably gonna be sailors that are junior to you. Um, or unless you're an LPO and you got first classes that are in your divisions. But for the most part, it's probably me saying it's junior to you. If you look at the second section, management or command level, that's dealing with superiors. You're doing something for the command. So you're doing something for the CO, XO, and CMC, and for the Navy. But this last section is the hardest section for first classes. Because it, you, know, you, you want to know what this requires in this section? Humility. It requires you to be humble enough to deal with conflict within your association and to speak and get past it for the greater good of your association. That is the hardest part. This section right here, a lot of people fail at because you don't wanna deal with your peers and it's hard to lead your peers. But when you can, when you can uh, handle conflict and know how to talk and be humble and communicate with others, this section becomes super easy. I'll give you guys a simple story and we'll move on. When I checked on board the USS George Washington, I was a first class and a, and a peer of mine, he was a first class. He was the, he was the LPO when I got there. And uh, when I got on board, I felt like I could have been the LPO, um, but he was it. So I, so I said to myself, I said, okay, well, if he's the LPO, how can we help him? Because it doesn't take one person to do everybody's eval. So I, I went and talked to him. I said, hey bro, uh, it's one of you and it's about four first classes here or five. I said, how about instead of you, all the sailors turning in their evals to you, how about we all take a section of sailors and they turn their evals into us and then we come together and we, we do the evals together at the end and we rank together. And he was like, shoot, we got it. And, we, and that's what we did. And that was with everything that we did. Everything was broken down as first classes. He was the LPO, he was in charge. And ultimately he took the credit for everything. However, we still contributed. And guess what? Everybody in that department made chief or, or probably now senior chief. So when you learn how to work together, it becomes a lot easier to get stuff done. All right. And then the last line, all caps, strong closing with promotion recommendations, just like I talked about in the previous slide. You've got to end strong. All right. If you're going to start strong, you got to end strong. That's a remember. Go ahead. Go ahead, Will. So that last line is actually talking to the board, but you're actually using the voice of the person who is also signing your eval, and that's usually the commanding officer. Basically, the commanding officer is endorsing you, saying, I like this person so much, you need to make them a chief right now. And that's what the, that's just one example of it, but you can see like closing remarks of that. We have seen closing remarks that said, you know, hard charging detail oriented, uh, detail to the most challenging assignments, you know, enders like that. So just, just, be, just be mindful, that's an audience question. So it's telling the board what to do, but it's also really in the voice of the commanding officer. Okay. And, and for those of you that, you know, just going back to that leadership section, 
So everyone on this on this Zoom call isn't a LPO. Am I right? Everybody on here isn't in a leadership position. And and I can speak on that just being out here in recruiting because I was a a, a senior first class as a uh, recruiter at a district. So I know in that section, you don't really have a lot to put in there when it comes, when it pertains to leading sailors. Am I, am I right? So, you know, you're going to put in there, you know, of course that you're, you're leading your future sailors, but what else would you put in there? I was waiting on somebody to ask that question because I know everybody on here is not an LPO. And I know you're probably curious as to what you will put in that leadership section or in that first block to kind of jump out at the board to, you know, let them know what you're doing. Is it your primary job? Like, wh what would you put in that block? What would you put in that section? Anybody? Do you have any suggestions on that, Chief? Uh, yeah, I do, actually. But I want to see what, what you got. And your primary job is definitely going to be it, because that's very important. Um, because you guys aren't all leading. And I remember coming out here as a first class at 14 years in the Navy, and all I wanted to do was lead. You know, all I wanted to do was lead, but all I could lead was my debt pool. You know, so at that point, you can put in there definitely your primary job and how you're benefiting the command or your station. You know, um, like Chief was talking about in the beginning when it comes to, you know, the abbreviations, you know, making sure that the board understands what you're putting there. You know, when it comes to NCO, you know, breaking that down, you know, it's not NCO, it's new contract objective, you know, putting in there how many NCO you put in, how did that benefit your station, you know, so that's what you would put in there, but your goal should be to definitely get your LPO call and to be put in the level of, of being an LPO and leading the station if you can, because some of you, unfortunately, you're not given that, that option. I know that. And then you go back out to the fleet and, you know, you want to make sure you still have something in there to show that you did, you know, you did something to try to get put in that position. And you also help benefit the station and the recruiting command. Does that kind of clarify it a little bit for y'all? Any other questions about that? Because I really want to touch on that because I know it's real difficult for you guys out here if you're not leading the station. Well, and the thing is, is I'm, uh, Chief's absolutely right. And part of sometimes how you represent leadership is, you, you know, you're actually one of the first people that are molding people to be in the Navy. So mm -hmm. believe it or not, you have a whole bunch of sailors. They're just called future sailors at the time. There is a chance to mold them and have your prepare. And you can even see on the back end, the success of the leadership that you prescribe to within your debt pools by how many actually graduate from boot camp. How many get through this? How many come back to be mentors themselves by coming on a rap duty? You know, junk like that. So your opportunities for leadership are sometimes bigger than sometimes give sometimes folks give themselves credit for. So you can engage them in, in that manner. And that's all you have to do. It's just representing that in text with your evaluation as, as your leadership tool or as your leadership line. Great point. <clears throat> and that, you know, that goes back to this being a special duty. You know, you got to understand when your evals go to the board and it says Kevin's a recruiter on there, if you're, you know, a fleet sailor, uh, you know, that's a big deal. That's one of the CNO's top priority billets. Recruiting, recruit division commander. All right, those are, those are top priority billets. So you, your leadership is there. It's just like Chief Evan said, you just got to know how to word that. And you, you guys are definitely leading when you have future sailors to deal with because they know nothing about the military. And you got to sit there and you, try, you got to try to hold on to those, those, those uh, future applicants for, what, months sometimes until they ship. It is not easy. It is not easy. All right, moving forward. Uh, we're going to get into some more of these. So, well, actually, we'll go ahead and uh, read this one. So this one says, and I'll just say Petty Officer. Petty Officer Smith is a motivated an exceptionally talented first class petty officer who has made magnificent impact in my command. She is an experienced, confident corpsman who continually demonstrates her superb knowledge in all aspects of her rating. Sounds pretty good, right? Or phenomenal leader and master corpsman performing at the season chief level, select a CPO now. I want y'all to look at those differences. And while you're looking at that, there's something else I want to cover. 
So when you're writing your, your evaluation block, you only have 18 lines, all right? You have to be able to make what you want to say, say it, but in a smaller amount of words. So you can say more. It's kind of like saying more with less. So you have this thick paragraph here that just took up four lines when we just narrowed it down to two lines. And if you read both of those paragraphs, if I were reading an opening of a book, that second one is the one that will entice me more to keep reading. Because why are you telling me to select this person to CPO now? And you're telling me that they're performing at a season chief level? Really now, that's what you're telling me. You're telling me that you got a first class that's performing at a season chief level. Okay, let's find out. And now we get into the meat and potatoes. Those four lines that you see up there at the top, I just read a lot. And now you only got, what, 12 more lines left. Actually, less than that because you got to have a closing statement. So when you're writing these evals, you need to learn how to say what you want to say, but with less. Let's look at another one. Ranks number one of 111 fiercely competitive first class petty officers. Petty Officer Smith is a superstar who brilliantly, there goes that word, excelled in a critical billet of influence in the command's most challenging division, demonstrated seasoned leadership and exceptional drive in every task, consistently producing flawless results. Your junior sailor will get that, or somebody who doesn't you know, uh, know much about evals will get that and say, man, I sound like I'm, I'm awesome. But you just took away, what, five lines there? Now look at this. My number one of 111 first class petty officers, an absolute superstar performing well above CPO expectations. Select immediately. Again, look at the difference in these two. Look how many lines you saved and look at what you're telling me. Select immediately? You're telling me that I need to select this person right now. Why? Why? You're telling me that they're performing above CPO expectations? Okay, we'll find out by reading. Although a brand new first class petty officer, she is already leading and mentoring as a seasoned chief. Put an anchor on her collar today and make her a chief now. Or ranked P due to first evaluation in pay grade, highly competitive for EP next cycle. That says a lot. That's that, that's that breakout that we were talking about. So there's a such thing as a hard breakout and a soft breakout. This is considered a soft breakout. You're telling the board that, hey, you just checked on board to this new command, and y'all seeing this, you, you check on board to a new command, you're probably, most commands you're probably gonna get a promotable, some commands are different, but you check on board this new command, and you're telling me that they're ranked as a promotable due to their first evaluation, and they're already competitive for an EP next cycle? You're telling me something about this sailor. That's, uh, that obviously means that they have hit the ground running at their new command. And if you could, you would have gave them a higher promotion recommendation. And then look at this, outperforming peers and produces exceptional results. Select that earliest opportunity. Now look at that one compared to the ranked one. Outperforming peers, just checked on board now and he or she is already outperforming her peers. Select that earliest opportunity. So that's a segue to that next evaluation. But here's the thing, and, and, and I wanna speak on this because I did some package reviews yesterday with some of the first classes and we talked about this. How many first classes have, have ever heard the terminology uh, progression? Yes. Yes, I have. Yes. Okay. How many of y'all, or Tim, let me ask this. How do y'all feel about progression? I stay away from that word when it comes to evals. Okay. Why? Because showing progression basically is telling me you're getting there, you're not quite there yet, but you're getting there. So you still got a little bit of time to perfect what you're doing as far as your primary job. Okay. 
I See, think- when you talk about whenever you say progression, when you're talking about progression as far as like the evals, your first eval showing a P, the next one MP, EP next, like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, that yes, that is progression. So no matter what, you want to do growth. You want you want to either like be moving up in your promotion because we know sometimes people are slated by promotion a little bit by the time on board. So you know the time on board with a station. Sometimes it's outside of your recruiting scope. I mean, outside of your regular job, it's a recruiting thing. It's completely different. You're learning along the way. You should be able to show growth, and the growth is also going to go up in promotion recommendation or in the individual trade average. And that and that's what you want to take. The the thing you do not want, and I say absolutely do not want, is to show backwards. You don't want to go backwards because now you're not you're not living up to potential. You're actually moving backwards. You want to always show like some kind of consistent growth, whether it is by adding on stuff. But we're giving it. A, I want to keep the focus more towards a quality evaluation rather than just completely leadership advice. The main thing is is that you want to show growth. And the thing is, is that, you know, as towards the end of your tour, you want to be able to compare your individual trade average against what the seniors average is. And you want to be above what that middle line is. So you want to like, as we have talk about bell curves with coronavirus, now we've got a bell curve of your performance. You want to always show on the other, on the, on the right side of that bell curve. Okay. My apologies. I thought you meant like progression as far as writing it in your eval. Right. I'll tell you this, you know, the more and more you write evals, whether it's for your subordinates or yourself, the quality is going to start to improve. You're going to see like how much of it changes by the time it gets back to you for final signature. And the fewer changes that come back means that you're starting to show a little bit of seasonality with, or you're being seasoned by, you understand what the expectation is for the leader and for the member or you're understanding what the voice is for the board and the voice of how to represent your true vision. You know, the eval should be written about who you are. I should be able to cover the names and still know who I'm reading about based off of what's there. You just got to remember that the audience is going to be people within your community or people within the Navy who have an understanding of what makes you a potential selection for the next pay grade. Good point. Chief Evans, you made me smile because you covered exactly what I was going to say. Thank you. All right. All right hey, so Chief, I, I have a question about the progression and with the uh, risk of PMA that they just recently added. Um, how does that affect the progression? Because, you know, those risks are pretty, pretty high nowadays when it comes to um, – uh, getting evaluated and taking the uh, test now. All right. So as you know from history, what you used to get graded on for your test was based off of you know P, MP, EP, and those had uh, you know 3.6, 3.8, 4.0 average associated with it. And then usually three evals within a year get averaged together, and that was what your PMA was. RISCA is basically trying to be a little more of a precise number because you can over inflate values in a bad way for selection purposes based off of test scores. So the RISCA is supposed to be the new average that takes for specifically your test score. That's, so like I said, it's a tiny bit more precise. So when you, when you get uh, taking chief, you're basically, it's your evals that are put together with the RISCA score and your actual test score and then they work the final multiple from there i i hope i'm not getting too far off the, a lot of the people on the board are going to see a risk of score they're going to be like uh, no the risk of score has to be there because that is more for the eso to put a score in for your selection off of the test or at least for being board eligible but you know e, e4 through five to e6 and those, those definitely for those those grades does that answer the question that you wanted? Yes, but what's the purpose of the summary group average now? Does that play a key part in anything anymore? It's a little bit more subjective. So you got to remember a lot of COs, you know, compare their average, their, their median averages to other COs of, of, a similar, of a similar thing, whether it's surface people or admin folks or, you know, pilots and stuff like that. They actually, and COs of different types of organizations, they actually compare their averages. So I can't, 
when it comes to the individual trade average, I can't really comment to why they choose the number that they give you. You know, how many 5.0s and 4.0s that they give you because they're trying to manage their average too. The thing, what I'm saying is, is that when you, when you go to BOL and pull your continuity report, you're gonna see an individual sum, uh, average and a summary group average. And what you're basically showing on that is that bell curve again. You wanna be on the right side, you know, a higher number than what the, the, end of the, the middle group is. Now, if it's your first eval, there's a chance that you might've gotten the standard P, you might be graded towards that because they do, a lot of organizations do try to give the appropriate individual trade average based off of where they fell out in the ranking from the EPs all the way down to the P's. But what, when you get to mid tour and final eval, you want to be definitely to the right side of the bell curve. Now, did I get to what you were looking for an answer on? Yes, Steve. All right. Thank you. It, it can be a complex process. It, it's 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 a little bit painful, but the growth the growth is what we really really wanted to set to set apart. And I'll tell you this: people get advanced to chief on PE valves. They they do. The, the, the strength of the write-up is what's important because you're going in front of the board. So like it, when we go to writing correct for the audience, writing correct for what's going to get you selected in your community, writing correctly for demonstrating that you show leadership. Even if it's your first eval on board, the strength of the write-up is going to be critical. And I mean, and I, I'm tooting my own norm a little bit. Every LPO that I've had advanced to chief because I've been seasoned enough to know how to write their or to assist their evals. They gave me good start. They gave me stuff that I had to cut out. So you always give more. It's better to cut stuff and then to try to figure out what to add. But writing it correctly. And the only the only two guys that never got selected had really good reasons. One was on his third PFA failure before I even met him. And the other one had so many drinking problems that he was ARI, ARI um, supreme. But absolutely everybody else made chief. And, and, and that's one of my crowning achievements when I do retire to say, hey, everybody did it. But it was based off of the strength of the evals. So even that LPO or even before they became my LPO, they had a strong write-up as their first PE eval on board station. Awesome. Good stuff. Good questions and good dialogue. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, you know, Chief Evans hit exactly where we're going to go into a couple of slides coming up in regards to the promotion recommendation versus the writing and the RISCA. I can tell you right now, QM1, the RISCA is a whole nother topic. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, be more than happy to do a training on as well. Um, because that, that as, as Chief Evan was explaining, you know, that, that's a whole nother, a whole nother beast in itself. But the purpose of where we were coming from just now and going back to where I was is progression is good. When, you're, when your evals go to the board, the Master Chiefs want to see progression, all right? And that whole eval bullet down here at the bottom where it says, this is somebody that's just checking on board the command. Outperforming peers produces exceptional results. Select the earliest opportunity. That tells the board that, yes, we know, you know that they're going to get a promotable. You know that they might not be where the risk is right now. And that's due to things behind the scenes that we can talk about, like you were saying. However, do understand that in this write-up, what I'm telling you is they are performing. So if you can promote them now, do it. That's what you're telling the board. It's all about the write-up. All right. And then so I had these pulled up as well. These are just some typical uh, statements. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm going to actually email you guys um, some eval uh, recruiter bullets that Chief Evans sent my way. So I'm going to forward that to you guys. But these are just some uh, opening or closing statements. And you can see the differences in the ones at the top as well as the ones at the bottom. If you read those, out, outperforming three of my first class CPOs today. Do not delay. Press 100% now. Fast track to seeing Chief Petty Officer. All right. When, when I gave that training to you guys back at the DTM, the reason they say press 100 is no secret. There's an actual button that they press. It's a confidence factor. If they press 100, they confidently believe that you're ready for the next pay grade. If they press 75, they 75% believe that you're ready. 50, 50%, and then zero. 
So if they're telling somebody to press 100, that means that they confidently believe that you are ready for that next pay grade. Now, don't, don't, I ain't telling you to go put on all one of your, all of your evals now, press 100. That's not what I'm telling you. <laughs> I see Will Cox right now. I'm about to put press 100 on all my evals. All right. So these are some um, uh, um, bullets that you can use on your evals to start off. Deck plate leader. That's what we expect of you. You should be a deck plate leader. Outstanding manager. Of course, not you wouldn't use Master Carmen, but technical expert. That's what, you know, E5s, that would be a great bullet. Uh, fully qualified rating expert, brilliant on the basics, command influence, sense of heritage, mess front runner, and then command slash uh, mess impact. So those are some different bullets you can use, but I'm going to send you guys out more. I have a full list of them I'm going to email to you, so you'll have that. Not innovative team player. It's that's too much. You're taking up too much space. This is too much. You want your bullets to be strict and to the point, and then you talk about the bullet. All right, before I click further on this, how many of you guys have heard of TAR? Has anybody heard of TAR? No. I know of it as FTS. <laughs> I knew you was going to say something like that. As far as eval bullet, TAR. Task, action, results. Task, action, results. What was your task? You were UPC, you were the DAPA, you were the LPO, you were the CFL. What was your task? What was your, your duty? And then action. What did you do with that task? Okay, so you were the LPO or you were the UPC or you were the DAPA. What did you do? You led, you managed, you coordinated, you executed, you produced, you authored, you facilitated. What did you do with that task? And then last but not least, what were the results? Resulting in, enhancing, increasing, decreasing, yielding. All right? Go to a recruiter standpoint, right? You, you, you are the LPO. You led this amount of sailors uh, in production, resulting in winning large station of the year, winning LPO of the year. Let's say you were the ACFL, all right? You uh, managed the command fitness program, uh, increasing um, you know, uh, physical readiness by however much percent or however many you people, however many people you had passed uh, the PFA, or you can even go on the flip side of that and say decreasing failures by however many percent. So task, action, results. Find when you go to write evals, whether it's for you or for your sailors, have them write down what the task is. What have they done? This is honestly, this is where the brag sheet came into play. The one thing that you guys never ever wanted to do. The chief would say, hey, send me your brag sheet. And you're like, oh, my God. Now I got to I got to remember what I did over the last year. That's your fault. And I'm going to tell you why that's your fault. Because you could, you should have been keeping a, either a running brag sheet or I told you guys a long time ago, if you put your sailor up for sailor of the quarter every quarter, even if you don't submit them, but if you write a sailor of the quarter package on your sailors every quarter, when, when the four quarters are up, you now have enough for a year based on four packages even if you don't send them up, have them write themselves a sailor of the quarter package nomination. You guys can do, you know, uh, ranking boards within your divisions. And then whoever you send up per chief is fine, but at least everybody else, you now have a quarter of what they done. Keep that in a division file. And then when it comes time to do their yearly evaluation, you can pull out those four quarters and look at what they've done. You got your task, you got what they did. And then usually at the end of the year is when you get results in a lot of things. All right, you find out who was who was what of the year. And bam, now you got that in that eval. Or if you do it for the quarter, say little quarter or recruiter of the quarter. But either way, task, action, results. Any any questions on that? Okay, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. All right, so here's a thick paragraph that this is what a, a beginner level eval writer would put. Consistently pushing others to excel, foster in an environment, development, and success. As MWR Chairman Petty Officer Jones led and supervised 64 peers and subordinates in flawless coordination, blah, blah, blah. To be honest with you, I don't even want to read the rest of that because it's just too much. Now, look at that thick paragraph and watch this. You broke it down by task, action, results. That whole paragraph 
We just broke it down right here by task, action, results. You were the command MWR chairman. You led 64 sailors in coordination of four major command morale events, 18 staff appreciation events, and 23 fundraisers. You raised 21K and enhancing the morale of 150 staff members. Simple as that. You know, that it looks like a math word problem that you're showing to work on. <laughs> I mean, you, you see it. This, this paragraph is huge. I mean, that looks like that's a whole eval. Just off one task, action, and result. So you break it down by that. All right, another thick paragraph. But this paragraph is a lot smaller than that initial one. Look at that. Look how, look how it changes. Look at the difference in those two. So my goal here, my, 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 my hope is, is that if you write the, the paragraphs that are that thick, that's fine to start off with, but then find a way to take words out that you don't need and get straight to the meat and potatoes. Right? I'm just about to say that. You just straight up got straight to the meat of it. You know, and that look, that's perfect. Because what you see all the time is you see evals written like that and they get to our level and we have to chop them down to the meat of them. So this real good stuff that he giving y'all, I hope y'all writing this down because this is really, really good info. As, as first class petty officers, if y'all can, if y'all can start doing this now, man, when you get to the chief level, as, as Chief Evans said, you, you, you gonna start being so seasoned to where you'll be able to write your sailors to the point where they all start making chief or first class or second class, if they're performing. Let me say that too. Don't be writing people up out there making them look like they're walking on water and they're not. Here goes another one. If, you, if, if any of y'all are ACFLs out there, check this out. As command ACFL, he fostered a culture of fitness, set the example for physical fitness for all sailors to emulate. He led, I'm tired of reading already. Imagine if I'm a master chief sitting aboard and I got thousands of evals to read. Now I got to read this thick paragraph. You know, or, I've been style wise, I've actually seen them remove the as this altogether. Because the thing is, is that your block 29, which I didn't correct Chief McCauley on when he said 27, but block 29 where you're putting in your collateral duties, if it's listed up there, then at some point they're going to want to see what the action was. Because I would even on the or take out the as ACFL led nine sailors in the facilitation of 245 hours of PT because they're going to know from block 29 that you were a CFL or ACFL. It's good to keep it trimmed because you got to remember these guys are reading a lot of evals, a lot of evals, every free word or free, free expression that you can give up, have it focused. It got to be focused with your tar it can be like very more of uh, talk about precise like we did with the risk of correct exactly there you go chief evans i didn't even know you could talk this much <laughs> oh chief evans got a wealth of knowledge you usually only have to talk when you have to <laughs> <laughs> with the knowledge all right, and then so here's some more uh, bullets. Some more, or, or not bullets, but things to understand about the eval. Sustained superior performance plus strong recommendation for CPO. So as first classes and second classes, sustained superior performance is number one. I, I cannot stress that enough. I, I, I kid you not, I had a, um, I had, when I was a, a second class, I knew a first class that won Sailor of the Year twice. He was, he was the Sailor of the Year twice. He never got selected for chief. And one thing I learned was, is it's not what you do at that moment or even that moment after that moment. It's what you do over time. So when you go somewhere and you're excelling, right? You're doing everything that you can do, great. You know someone that won Sailor of the Year, awesome. But if they don't get selected, you need to understand that it's not just about what you've done for that year, or that year prior or that year after is what you have done over time. Have you been consistent with your performance? Or did you just now wake up and start paying attention? So sustained Chief, superior, about that. So are you saying like if my last command I've done 
for example, MWR first class, well, I'm not going to say first class Petty Officer Association. Now. Let's just use MWR for example. Uh, I've done MWR at my last command and I do it at this command. Is that some type of progression? Is that something that I shouldn't be doing at my next command because it's already in my email and I show that I have some type of progression with that? Or could I still do the same um, collateral duties at every command? Like how, how would that work? So I, I'll, I'll speak on this. So if you've had MWR before, the one thing I'm hoping that you're representing in this new MWR organization is a leadership position within MWR. Because MWR is almost like it's small, uh, its own little mess in, in its way. So if you're taking on a position of responsibility within that organization, that'll be an enhancer. But I will say, I don't want you to get typecasted. I don't want you to get completely locked into being that your, uh, that's your responsibility. That's a good motivation. I mean, you're, you're motivated by it. You do well, well with the program. But now it's time to start testing your comfort level. And that's why you got to, um, you know, at a first class level, you got to start looking at a high first class or chief level type collateral duty. Because I have to admit, an MWR, a leadership responsibility with MWR, it's great. I saw it. Now I want to see you break out of that because sometimes you might, you know, some of those guys might have a prejudice and think that MWR, that's where I put my E4s and my E5s to be workers and be successful there. You're moving to another level. Now I want you to be a UPC coordinator. Now I want you to be a DAPA. Now I want you to start thinking about being a command career counselor, you know, stuff to not just enhance people's happiness, but now things to enhance their progression forward and their careers. I have no further information on that. I completely agree. That makes sense, Chief. At the end of the day, do not get complacent. Comfort, you know, keeping the same collateral duties makes you comfortable. Being a chief is very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. We get thrown into roles and jobs all the time that we are probably not uh, used to, but it builds character. And I know some people hate that term, but I'm being so honest with you. There were so many times I got thrown in positions I did not want to do, but as I learned it and moved forward, I'm glad that I did it because that's now an extra tool in my tool belt that I can use. By the way, Duran, your, your statement within the chat, was that about an MWR thing or is that about evals? It was about evals. Okay. I forgot about this. And just to touch on that, when you was talking about progression, um, I think that's great too because when you step outside of your comfort zone and you're doing something that you also have to learn that you've never done before, be it career counselor, uh, ACFL, UPC, you know, that's definitely something that it'll look good on your eval and it's also good for you just going into a leadership position. So when you're leading sailors, you know about this program and, and you, you're an SMB in it. So that's definitely something for for progression too, not just in terms of your eval, but also for you as a sailor. Correct. All right, demonstrated leadership, LPO at sea is huge. Uh, significant roles in deck plate sailorization. So if you can get LPO at sea, that's, 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 that's awesome. Obviously the CRFs, you, your, your leadership will come within your division. So, you know, that's why you have the CRF, CRF here. You know, those DLPO and DLCPO calls are, are huge. And, and, and holding those, those uh, jobs are huge. So make sure that you actually demonstrate leadership, not just have the title, but actually demonstrate it. Strong breakout among peers in large groups are much better than one-on-one -on -one rankings. And I think, that's, I think we can all understand why that is so. We wanna see how well you do against your peers versus on your own. So an EP of one-on-one -on -one is not the same as an EP, uh, you know, one of 385 completely different all right documented performance qualifications and advanced watch stations all right so for example for the, the sailors that are here that are fleet sailors uh, as uh, Chief Patillo mentioned if you can go out and get the LPO qual go get it if you can go get the DLCPO qual go get it all right those are quals that are out of your rate however it looks good on you because you are learning out of your rate go get those qualifications and it's just like when you're on a ship, if you get qualifications on a ship that are out of your rating, same concept. Tough assignments. So serving in support of anything global war on terrorism, uh, anything arduous sea duty, instructor billets, RDC tours, recruiter duty, 
special programs, and in rating short duty assignments hold more weight than general duty. So all of y'all that are here at recruiting duty, you are at a arduous duty. You already have something in your favor. But the question is, what are you going to do about that here? And to be honest with you, when the mission gets hard, when, when the chief is asking of you to do so much, do understand there's a reason for that. This is not like other assignments. So if you can excel here, if you can go above and beyond here, that speaks volumes about you and your character and your career. Understand that. There's a reason why you're getting that special duty assignment paid because they know it's hard. They know it's rough. They know it's long hours. They know that you're going to have to work on the weekends, go take people to MELPS on Sundays. They know that. There are people sitting on those boards that have done numerous recruiting tours. So when, it's, when, when, when you're frustrated and when you're stressed, there's nothing wrong with venting. Talk to your chief about it, but keep going because it will pay off in the long run. I promise you. Collateral duties, command impact, especially those outside the division and department, proper seashore rotation, FCPO, JEAC set impact, and then last but not least, education and community service. Make sure that you're hitting all these wickets. It's right here for you. And these are the things that you don't want to see. This is what the board does not want to see. A decline in responsibilities a failure to obtain a, a qualification if you're able to get it. Limited leadership or LPO experience. Relaxed assignments back to back shore. Now, let me speak on that. If it's not your fault, then that's okay. If you apply for a C duty and there's no C duty abilities available, they understand that. You just make sure that you mention that to the board and your chief can tell you how to do that. Instructor tour without MTS, pattern of assignments and overseas shore commands, PRT or PFA failure, and of course, NJP. If you have any of these in your record with nothing to show for it, you have now put yourself behind the curve. And I want you to understand this. This is what we talked about for 30 minutes earlier, what Chief Evans was hitting on. It's your block 43 and it's your RISCA, not your EP, MP, and P. What is in that write-up? What does it say about you? And then where do you fall in align with your reporting senior's cumulative average? If you just check on board, chances are you're probably gonna be below the RISCA, especially if you didn't have a lot of time to prove yourself, but the write-up can speak to that. If you've been on board of command for three years and you're still below the RISCA, there's a problem. All right, this is where that progression comes into play. There's nothing wrong with starting off with a P below the <laughs> What are you gonna do on your next evaluation? What have you done within that year to move up either at the risk or above it? And that's it for the PowerPoint. So I'm gonna show you guys what I'm gonna email you. And then I will leave it open for the chiefs to answer any questions. Let me stop share on this. So I'm going to email you all. All right, let me share this. I'm gonna email you all this eval template, all right? The reason why I'm gonna email you all this eval template is because if you type your write-up in here, you have your 18 lines that you need. And you can simply copy and paste this to NAVFIT 98. I highly recommend you do not type your write-up in NAVFIT 98. I highly recommend because that system will close down on you so fast and you will lose your whole write-up. So write your, write your eval write up in this Microsoft Word template so you can save it. Send this to your chief ahead of time so they can review it. Let them mark it up. And that's how you do training on eval writing. That's how you get better. Start typing this ahead of time. Send it to your chief to review it. 
let them say, okay, well, I would change this. I would look at this or I would do that. And then send it back to you and work your angles that way. So it gives you time to learn and you can save it and move forward. So I'm gonna send you guys a template. I'm gonna erase all this and send you guys a template so you'll have it. I'm also gonna send you this that uh, Chief Evans sent me. All right, let me go to my screen and share it. So this is gonna be really beneficial for all of you. So this right here, our eval bullet strictly for recruiting. It's for production, debt management, leadership, classifier, trainer, and it has pre-bullets and closing statements. And I mean, it's pages, documents worth of different bullets that you can use in your environment. Because remember, we talked about knowing your audience. This all has Navy recruiting information on here. So of course, just like when you're writing a paper, I'm not telling you to plagiarize. However, you can take this and use it as a foundation and make it work for you. So much information here. So I'm, I'm gonna email this to you so you have it. And then last but not least, I want you to view Let me see if I can share this. I want you to view this as well. All right, so if you go on Google and type in Navy Eval Writer, it'll take you to the Eval Writer page. You need to know this as a first class. No ifs, ands, or buts. You need to know this, this little chart right here. I would even print it out and have it at your desk or something similar to this. But you need to know when evals are due for E1 to E3, E4, E5, and yourself. You shouldn't be writing your chief's evals. But yourself and below, you should know those dates. And as well as the actual eval dates, you should know when the midterms are due. I'll tell you, those dates have been asked as questions at our JSOQ and SOQ boards, too. I'm sorry, say again, you went, you, you went out a little bit, G. Those dates actually represent questions that we've had on the SOQ and JSOQ boards. Yep. There you go. So this page, if I were you guys, I would go print it out and know this. Know these dates. And guess what? If you know that the E5 evals are due in March, I would say between uh, January, December and January, I would start uh, doing my write-up to my chief and start kicking it to chief. Say, chief, hey, I know, the, I know the E5 evals are coming up in March. Here's what I got. And if, and, if, and if you want to show your chief that you're ready to go to the next level, you start doing things that your chief needs without even asking for it. You already know the chief is going to have to do the March E5 evals. You already know that they're gonna have to do the E4 June evals. And if you know this, then you say, hey chief, just to let you know I already got this written up. Tell me what you think. I'm working on it for uh, EM2 so-and-so or GSM so-and-so. I guarantee you chief is gonna go back and be like, damn, QM1 or NC1, own it. You just made chief's life that much easier. That much easier. So don't wait for chief to tell you that evals and sale of the quarter packages and recruiter the quarter packages are due. You be proactive. Hell, all you guys have planners, especially if you go NC. All y'all got planners, you plan production. So if as an NC, if you already doing planners, add your sailors, sailorization stuff to your planners. For you fleet sailors out there, if you're not familiar with planners, well, you need to be familiar with planning. So plan ahead. A, a, a strong leader is someone who has a vision and you can see into the future. You already know that this is coming down the pipeline. We're in April right now. All right. So I don't think you guys have E4s here, but if you do, you got it coming up in June. You should already be looking forward to that. And if not, then guess what? E6 comes in November. So all y'all first classes, I would already start working on my eval now. I ain't saying it's gotta be completely done, but guess what you can do? You can project. We're, we're about to hit May. You can project out to November of what you are going to get completed. Send that right up to your chief, have them review it every month, whatever the case might be, kick it back. And, and now you set yourself goals to achieve. If you know you wanna get your 20th goal wreath by November, 
hey, work towards it, whatever the case might be. But you can go ahead and start having that on the schedule. You have a vision. All right, so I'm going to stop share. That is going to conclude the PowerPoint and the email training part that I'm going to send to you. Uh, at this moment, I will open it up for any first classes or any chiefs. The first class, if you have questions or chiefs, if there's some more nuggets you want to drop, this is that time that we got before we end this training. Hey, um, one block that sometimes people overwrite, uh, the Chiefs don't get this block anymore after you make Chief, but um, don't ignore that block 44. That block 44 is your extra time to show, you know, those awards and the qualifications and the volunteer work and the trainings or the school that you're doing. Please don't ignore that for yourselves or for the, for the folks that you support writing evals for. There, that, that's, a, that's a lot of free meat. That's correct. Absolutely. So first class, is any questions out there? Hey, Chief. Hey, Chief. Hey, Chief. Hey, Chief. Um, I have a question about, it's for Chief Pertillo, I believe. I'm not one. Is it an echo? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So my question to you is, we talked about a decline in responsibility. So I got two back-to-back -back evals here. Um, my last eval says LPO because we had a chief that came in. So he took, I turned over to him my division. But before that, I was DLPO. Is that looked or is that frowned upon for board purposes, do you think? Because it goes well, yeah. CPO. They are going to question that, you know, because you were at a, a, a divisional a DLPO position and now you're in an LPO position. So it definitely will, will be questioned. Um, will it be a bad look? I don't think so um, necessarily because of, it, it'll be all about the, the, the meat of, of what you're doing while you're here. Um, it can be, it can be looked at as, as a decline. It definitely can. Um, but of course, you know, some, te some people make moves for personal circumstances over professional, you know what I'm saying? And that's understood. So um, at that point, it's just a chance you take because they could definitely look at that as to why was she running a division over here? Because you ran a division over in, in, in RD San Diego, right? Vegas, yes, Chief. Yeah, yeah. how long did you run it for? Um, it was actually eight months, but on my eval, 2018 says DLPO and block 29. Like, that was my responsibilities. Okay. In 2019, it says LPO and block 29, but in block 43, it actually has it. So they probably see it, and then they would read it and be like, oh, okay. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they would have yeah. to go to the actual write-up block 43 for that, though. Yeah, yeah. So the best thing I can tell you, like, do you plan on eventually uh, taking the DLCPO position here? I know you and I talk uh, offline a little bit, but, um, and we can if you want to, again, if you want to go further into that. But I think, you know, if, if that's something that you plan on doing, you definitely should when it comes to, um, you know, being picked for chief. They're going to start NC1. You do have your DLCPO call. You did sit this floor and you are here and you could potentially be put in that position again. Okay. So there's so that you won't be. So I, it, it can be looked at both ways, honestly. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. You're welcome, NC1. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because I was going to touch on the quals too. Um, just from an NC perspective, being out here for a lot of you guys that will be going back to the fleet, um, you, you definitely out here being outside of your primary job, your primary rating. Uh, you do definitely want to keep track of what you're doing out here because it's very easy for, for the duties and the, the things that you do out here to get lost in, in translation. And when it's time for you to do your evals, you kind of lost and you kind of just try and remember what, man, what did I do? You get evaluated one time a year. Make sure you give yourself that just do and remember what you did. Um, keep track of it. I know I used to, um, even if it's just on a little sticky, you know, some of us are more, uh, <laughs> organized than others but just that make sure that you're you're finding some kind of way to keep track of what it is that you're doing mentoring collaterals uh community service uh mess involvement all of those things so that you have that to put in there because you you do get evaluated once 
um, throughout the year. The other thing is um, with the qualifications, and I'm glad NC1 brought up that, that you know, DLCPO send the seed. You know, for your, those of you that are in seeds, um, you definitely want to try to leave here with that DLCPO call. Um, print out your PQS, have it ready. You know, when you're doing training or you're doing a sit down with your DLCPO, get them to sign off on your stuff. Um, those of you that, you know, LPO call is not mandatory. It's not mandatory for you to get that, but it's, it's definitely, uh, in my opinion, it's necessary. You only have to go up to your advanced recruiter board and some people are comfortable with leaving with just that call. But you, if you're trying to make chief, if you're trying to, uh, you know, be put in that leadership position, you should want to get your LPO call. You don't want to leave out here from out of, of recruiting duty without that. And hopefully sometime soon, uh, I'll talk to the other DLCPOs as well. And NC1, you can probably get in on it too. And we can start doing training on, on DLCPO boards. I think that'll be a good idea. Um, I do want to tag in and I, I, I'm sorry I'm not in the recruiter trade itself but specifically I can see where your concern is and how I would address that concern is the fact that you want to make sure that the board doesn't think you were fired. You want to make sure that the board does not think that you were fired, that you were relieved, you weren't doing a bad job. It's just more about maybe it was a seniority thing. You know, the person that was transferring in, they have to have their opportunity to try to shine in the job, and you were just filling it as, as basically a line of spack along the wall. So there's two ways that I'm thinking that you can still communicate that. Now, remember, you get a chance to do a letter to the board when you're putting your board package together. And I would remark in the line like that, you may see that I went from DLPO to LPO. And the reason was, is I was temporarily filling the role successfully. And then the person who was assigned to be that job took over. And then I supported them 100% to make them successful. The more official way is that, you know, if you never saw, if you never click the box, you know, I intend to submit a statement. You can actually submit a statement on your eval for two years. So you can actually submit a letter, a properly formatted letter to be included as a remark. It has to be respectful, it has to be precise, it has to be, you know, basically the line that we said. I was not relieved from being a DLPO. I was marked DLPO, the person who was senior came in and took over, and then I supported them as an LPO from that point on. So you're trying to make sure that no one took away from you, let me try to give back. All right, does that help a little bit? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, Chief, it does. That's exactly how I was looking at it. Like, I don't know what to do, but you made a valid point, and I will do one of the two of those. Oh, both. Any other first classes got questions? Uh, yes, Chief McCauley, I do have a question. What do you guys, as Chief, suggest that we do to make us first classes stand out in this pandemic while we're working from home. Hmm. Okay, so I give my thoughts real quick on this. Um, well, you gotta understand I'm coming from a Corman perspective. So number one, for me, uh, health is, is paramount. Honestly, I could, this is the Corman coming out. I care more about your health and your family than anything else. So. If you're talking about volunteering out to do things, to me, that is a no, unless there's social distancing involved. But other than that, that is a no. But let me say this, COVID-19, and we talked about this as a mess too, just last night, uh, actually us three did, um, but COVID-19 has posed many challenges to the whole world, not just us. But in those challenges, we don't use the word challenges. We use the word opportunity. Opportunities. Um, and in, in, in this time, it has definitely given us great opportunities to learn how to, to uh, work in other ways, i.e., right now, Zoom, correct? Uh, you know, I was, I was not familiar with Zoom until just recently, and now I love it. I think this is a great opportunity for us to see each other and, and have good training. So your question about what can you do during this time, because we know that a lot of things are at a standstill. You guys can do trainings amongst yourself as first classes. And I mentioned this, I think maybe the HO one Chambers or someone. But you guys can do, you know, you guys have titles or experience that you have done previously. 
Some of you guys have been career counselors. Some of you guys have been DAPA. Some of you guys have, I think YWAM makes all his career counselor here. Some of you guys are ACFLs here. Like you guys can give training amongst yourself to better yourself, uh, you know, as an association. And you got to remember what your, what, what the role is of the FCPLA as well as the CPLA. Our focus here is to better each other in order to better the command and better the Navy. Okay. I say, I, I say again, our job is to better each other in order to better the command and better the Navy. So how do you do that? Be innovative. Think of new ways to better yourselves. I, I'll put a challenge out to y'all. I almost think that in, in some ways, as best as you can, you should uh, cross coordinate like lessons learned and not just lessons learned. What did you find successful in this new adaptive environment? Mm -hmm and share that as, as lessons from, you know, uh, recruiters and DLPOs and DLC and, and who are doing really successfully right now, what actions are making them successful to be able to pass them off. You know, cause you know, sometimes I've seen like these old nav admins that used to come out the same, hey, this is what this command did to improve their uh, command climate, or this is what they did to improve their retention values. Well, now we get a chance to do that too because we're experiencing some dramatic change or dramatic flexibility. And I think we can like share a lot of the, there's a better word than lessons learned, but they're, you know, the, the things that are working right in this environment. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think that's an awesome question. Uh, I think it was Q and one that, that asked that question. Uh, what you can do right now to stand out is, um, help your chief. I'll tell you that from a DLCPO level. And, and I say that because um, when I say help, giving ideas, because recruiters and, and LPOs, you guys are the ones that are out there. You're beating the streets. Y'all know what work and what don't work, honestly. And, and, and to be completely transparent, a lot of stuff is coming down to us from people who aren't out here, who haven't recruited in years, who have no idea the, the challenges that, that we dealing with out here. So the best thing that I can tell you, and I know I hit up a couple of my first classes today, um, I wanna hear what y'all ideas are. You know, if, if you know, we have a lot of people that are coming to us with, you know, um, not, I ain't gonna say complaints, but you know, just, just why are we doing this? Give me a solution. I like, I legit wanna hear it. So the best thing that you can do right now is, is go to your chief like, hey chief, you know, I know we're doing this social media stuff, or, or I know we're making phone calls, or I know we're, you know, whatever it is that, you, that your prospecting plan is in your division, give them ideas, be innovative. Because I think right now is the time for, for, for y'all to shine. You know, y'all know what works, man. Y'all know some of this stuff that's being put out is, is, is crap, and it ain't gonna work. And, and definitely the social media stuff, you know, it, it's not gonna come to immediate fruition. So what, like, what are your recommendations? Like put that out, stand out, because I promise you some people are, are giving more complaints than they are solutions. And I'm glad you answered that question because it got me fired up. But um, that's, that's, what you, that, that's, that's, what you, that's what you should be doing. You know, y'all got ideas, share them. Definitely. That is, I love that, it. That is, that is awesome. I 100% I, I agree, 100% agree. That is the answer. Does it answer the question a little bit, and you know, I mean, if it don't, you can call me offline, and we can have some more conversations. You know, because I know people got stuff to do. But that's that's what I would say, just from a, a DLCPO level, is to just help, um, give ideas, be innovative, um, and and just think outside of the box. Because right now we're in a changing environment, um, and we will not be able to get uh, things done the old way. It's it's a new time, so so give us some new ideas. That's all I got. Hey, uh, QM, QM1, also with that, uh, it, it, you, can't, you can't top that. So I'll just add to what uh, CP3 said. Um, as far as personal growth, this is also a good time to take care of those things that you probably couldn't do when you were in the office all the time or, or out on the streets mm -hmm. recruiting. So since you are sitting in front of a, of a computer, uh, teleworking, why not go ahead and throw that SCJ PME in there? Why not throw that PPME in there? Why not knock out some non-resident training courses? Why mm -hmm. not maybe think about doing some online school? You know, why not do the things that the traditional recruiting round couldn't offer because you literally had to be out somewhere all the time. So now that you're home, 
and I know, and I know, I'm, I'm, I can't speak to everybody's individual environment because I know some of you guys have to teach, you know, your children online too. But since you're on a computer, find, do Lean Six Sigma courses, Navy Cool, US Map. You should be, y'all should be logging hours every day. Mm -hmm. We ain't got no more. Oh well, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> do, do some Navy Cool. Find some certifications to do. But I guarantee you, professional military education, you can, you, you can never get enough of that. Always find something to do on JKO and NKO. Knock out them courses. Make yourself stand out. And when we, we're still doing boards, say little quarter boards, when we do them, if we're doing them virtually, if that's how we're going to do it now, still do those. And I do appreciate y'all for jumping in and doing those. There are still things you can do to be successful at this moment. Mm -hmm. Hey team, I'm gonna probably duck out, but I want to end you with like one tiny motivational. It is uncomfortable to write about yourself. It is sometimes uncomfortable to write yourself for others. But if you avoid it, it's gonna be a problem for you. Embrace the suck and figure out how to write evals really well. Figure out where the punctuation is supposed to go on the administration blocks. Figure out all of it. Because you almost want to change what you're apprehensive to doing to like, let me make this a Michelangelo sculpture. So embrace the suck. Stay safe in this environment. Thanks for all the people that you send down to MEPS. I haven't gotten sick yet. Later. <laughs> Thank you, brother. And with that, does anybody else have any questions as well before we get ready to log out? Because we do got to get back to work. I had a question, Chief. Yes. Uh, this may sound like a dumb question, but uh, let's say, you know, you're pre-planning, you're writing your eval, right? It goes up the chain of command. It's getting chopped already from what's been chopped. And let's say this junior sailor or the sailor, they got a uh, sailor of the quarter or division top recruiter, but it wasn't put into that eval. Can they put in the next eval? Why not? Okay, I mean, yeah, if, 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 if I'm understanding correctly, you won, you're saying like a sailor won, sailor the quarter, but it didn't make it in the eval? Correct. Well, my first question is, why, why, did, why did you allow that? I'm not saying you per se, but I would have asked, why is sailor the quarter not in my eval? Right, it was, it was during the, the quarter when the evals were pretty much being submitted, and then we had the wards, um, you know, the banquet, mm -hmm. and then they got... Uh, yeah, added on that Add it to the next one. Now, if this is a first class going up for chief, put it in the letter to the board. Thank you. Anybody else? Chief, how many more packages you have to look through? I'm, I'm slated for three more that I'm about to set up for Zoom. Okay. Anybody else? All right, Chief P, you got anything else to, uh, to any last encouraging words? No, nah, I'm good, man. I'm just, I think it's awesome that, you know, we have the, the first classes that we have on here today that took the time out of the day to get on here. It's important to you. So I love that, you know, that, that that's the best part of being a chief, honestly, you know, and, and I honestly wanted to talk about something. And I told you already, I wanted to speak on something outside of, of just production. I think sometimes we get out here and we forget that we're sailors. Like that's the one thing like we all have in common, which we're, we're different rates and some are CRF, some aren't, you know, but we're all sailors and we all want to do well. We, we all want um, to be, you know, notarized that we're, that we're doing well. So um, I think it was great that you gave this training. I think it was great that they got on here. It's only going to make you guys better. And I hope y'all took notes, but hey, this is the best step forward right here. So I'm, I'm proud of all y'all for getting online. I think it was good. Good training. And if anybody needs my number, I'll put it in the chat. You know, you can hit me up. I'm always free to, you know, just mentor and to talk to y'all and give you any kind of advice I got. We all have different things, different ways of doing things, but ultimately, that's what I'm going to go with. I'll just post my number in the chat if y'all have any questions. Awesome. Well, with that being said, again, uh, thank, like Chief Patillo said, thank you all for uh, joining in. It is awesome. I, I would like for you guys to get your peers, more of your peers out here. I see, I think we got up to 20 people. There's definitely more than 20 first classes at this command. So you are only strong as each other. You are your brother and sister's keeper and iron sharpens iron. 
So y'all got this information today. Kudos on you. I'm going to email this out to the entire FCPOA. But I do, I do want more participation from your mess in the future trainings ahead. All right. With that being said, you guys have a blessed, a blessed day. Stay safe. All right. And take care of your family. All right, Chiefs. Thanks a lot, Chiefs. Thank you.